Hey, hey, do it yourselfers. It turns out Toyota made vehicles also break down. That's right, the LS400 is back. Now, to be accurate, it never left because it's my car. But the mistake I did was after we properly diagnosed and replaced the bad throttle position sensor on this car in my last video, I didn't test drive it. I simply parked it outside. Then I got busy on drywalling and painting the garage. That was more than a few weeks ago. But then I went to test drive this the other day and it's doing the same exact thing, which is, you know, the, as the RPM reaches 2000 RPMs, it starts to fluctuate. The check engine lights comes on and starts flashing, which is basically pretty much the same thing as it did before. So that's what we're gonna try to fix today. But for those of you that did not watch that video, here's a 30 second recap of what we did in that video. So as some of you may know, most uh, mechanically controlled throttle position sensors, which is very common on older cars, and that's what we have here, the 93 or 94 LS400, work somewhat similar to this. You know, they, get, uh, you know, they usually have three wires. You got one wire carrying reference voltage, usually five volts. Then you obviously have a ground wire grounding your sensor, and then you have a signal wire. As the throttle plate opens and closes by the way of the, the cable that's connected to your gas pedal, the resistance inside your throttle position sensor changes. As that changes, it sends a varying signal in the form of varying voltage back to your ECM. Your ECM or engine control module uses that info along with other info it receives from the other sensors to make sure it can run your engine efficiently and correctly. Now what's different on this car is that you also have a fourth wire going to our throttle position sensor which is called the idle switch. Now, this fourth wire carries 12 volts. When the throttle plate is closed, that 12 volts grounds at the same grounding wire inside your throttle position sensor. And when it grounds, it goes down to zero. That's when the throttle plate is closed. When it goes down to zero, your ECM knows that the throttle plate is closed. You know, it adjusts uh, how it runs the engine that way. And then when you open the throttle plate, this should go back up to 12 volts. And then your ECM then knows that the throttle plate is open, you know, it, it, and then it adjusts accordingly. Now the problem we had on this car was that on the idle switch, you could actually, this is supposed to be an on and off switch where it's either 12 volts or zero volts. But as we move the throttle position or the throttle plate back and forth, we could make it stand right in between where it would show four volts or one volt or three volts or eight volts. It wasn't accurate. So it was working more like a potentiometer than an open or closed switch. And then when we went and got the replacement and plugged it in and tested it with our multimeter, we couldn't replicate the problem. It would jump from zero to 12 volts or I think 10 and a half volts if I remember correctly. No matter, and no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't make it stick to something between zero and 12 volts, you know, like the old bad throttle position sensor. So the throttle position sensor was bad, we had to replace it. So we did that, but we didn't test drive the car. Now if you watched that video, you may remember that, again, we had 10.5 volts on the idle switch wire going to the throttle position sensor instead of 12 volts or battery voltage. Now we brushed it off at that time due to the battery being, uh, having a low charge, but I fully charged this battery and this battery now has 12.8 volts, I, test, I load tested it as well. It's all good to go. And now when we probe our connector for our throttle position sensor, we're getting 10.65 volts, which is still off from 12 volts for battery voltage. All right, so basically we need to figure out why we're only having 10 and a half volts instead of battery voltage on this wire. There's a couple of ways that this could happen. Again, uh, in this case, the likely culprit is gonna be the ECM only supplying 10 and a half volts on this wire. The other circumstances where this could happen is that you could, it's not gonna be a likely scenario for our, in our case, because uh, the reasons I'm about to mention, you could have, let's say, a corrosion on the connector or the wire somewhere on this wire. But that's unlikely to be the cause because we both tested with the connector attached to the TPS and the connector disconnected from the TPS. And when you disconnect the connector, basically you're opening the circuit when you open the circuit, you get whatever voltage you have at the source, you know. Open circuit, you know, there's no, doesn't matter what resistance you have in the middle, there's no voltage drop because the circuit is not complete. You only have voltage drop when the circuit is complete. So yeah, basically this is unlikely since we measure the same voltage with the connector disconnected from the TPS. But there's another way that this could happen and that is if you have both corrosion and damage to the wire, at the same time, you're shorted to to battery negative 
at this where the corrosion is. So that completes the circuit. And at the same time, there are still a few strands of wire left that are passing through the voltage drop at the site where this has happened. If that's the case, then the circuit completes here. So, you know, let's say you have 12 volts here, the circuit completes here, and then you're basically measuring the voltage drop here at the connector. So if that's the case, then yeah, this could be due to buildup and a short to ground. And there's a way to test that, but we need access to the ECU on this computer, and that's what we're gonna do next. Goes without saying, you wanna make sure you remove the negative side of your battery first before messing with your ECU. All right, so the ECU on these cars lives behind this uh, glove box, I believe right under here. So we need to first remove the glove box. So we're gonna pry out these two plastic tabs, get these out of the way. All right, so hopefully we won't break these. And there's a second one. And then there's five clips holding it in. There's three on the bottom. We're missing one here. And then, but then there's uh, two more up top that we're gonna remove next. There's one. There's the second one. And the last one. All right, next, before we totally remove the glove box, there is a cover here that has this airbag connector attached to it. We need to remove that from the glove box and put it inside like this so that the glove box can slide out. There we go. There's a connector for our glove box light that we'll need to remove next. And then this comes out with the glove box. All right, next we need to remove these two 10 millimeter bolts. And then we close this back up. And then we'll come down here and remove this kick panel, which will reveal more bolts that we can remove. All right, so you basically yank on this and hopefully this will come out. There is, uh, I think, three clips up top that are holding it in. There we go, one out. There's a second one. There's a third one. All right, so now we need to remove three bolts. There is one there, one here, and then one in the back as well. So we slide the sound and out. And there's our ECU. All right, so here we go. Here's a closer look at our engine control module. Here are all the connectors in the back. Now we just have to go and look up our service data and wiring diagram and find out which one is what. We need to find the wire that supplies 12 volts from here on the idle switch wire to the TPS. All right, so here you can see pin number 32, idle one, which is basically the idle switch wire throttle position sensor on connector number E9. You go back here, E9 is this guy right here. Number 32 would be this one right here. So actually you first come up here, remove the connector from our throttle position sensor and make a note of the color for the idle switch wire, which is gonna be this third one and it's green. And the E9 connector on this ECU is gonna be the biggest one, which is this guy right here. I'm gonna try to do this one-handed. Nope, need both hands. There we go. All right, then we come down here, and then since the view we had on the manual was from behind the connector, and it was one pin, two pins to the left of this notch, it's actually, since we're facing it, it's gonna be to this side. So it's gonna be this guy right here. And if we were to turn this around, there you can see, there's the green wire right there. And then you can even double check and make sure you have the right wire. You get your multimeter, put one pin on the the right pen for the idle switch wire, which was the green wire on the connector for the TPS. Then you get your multimeter, of course, you set it to continuity. And then with the other test lead, you're gonna touch the right pen. And there, you can hear the beep. That means we have continuity, we're on the right wire. All right, next we're gonna back probe this pen on the connector side to our ECU. There, just back probe it and you can hear the beep. That means we have good connection here. And then we remove our test lead from the connector side on the TPS. And you wanna guess what we're gonna do next? Yep, you guessed it. We're gonna test for continuity to ground at, on this wire. And since we've disconnected the wire at the ECM and removed the connector at the TPS, any continuity to ground by the way of our multimeter would mean that we have a short to ground and that's the cause of our voltage drop. And if there is no continuity, that means there's no other way that the laws of physics would allow for this to happen that I can think of, uh, that we could have 10 and a half volts besides having 10 and a half volts to start off with. And that will mean a bad ECM. All right, so here's a moment of truth. I'm gonna connect it to this negative cable. And if we don't hear a beep, which we don't, but not just that, we also need to check and make sure we have no reading at all on, the multi, on our multimeter. 
So there, we have absolutely no continuity to ground, which means, again, there is no way that this wire from our, the connector for our TPS to the ECU has any problems, no short to ground, no resistance in the wire that we can count for or that shouldn't be there. Therefore, it means we have a bad ECU. This guy right here, and we're gonna open this up and we're gonna inspect all the capacitors because as some of you know, these capacitors on these ECUs, on these cars, tend to go bad, but not just that. The capacitors inside the instrument cluster panel also go bad, causing it to flash or the lights to go out. And that's actually the problem we have here is that the lights intermittently, the background lights for the dash, the instrument panel, they come and go. And you know, I suspect the capacitors are, are bad in that as well. All right, so here's a look at our ECU all opened up. And if you were to look at the capacitors closely, especially these three, these two specifically, these two up here, I'm gonna try to get you guys a better shot. Yeah, you can see them. These guys, they're definitely, they're definitely leaking. So these two are bad. Actually, these three, this one also leaking, but this one's gonna be harder to see. You have to see right between, right, right there. Hopefully you can see that that one's also leaking. Now there's uh, three or four on this side. They seem to be in okay shape. However, on this board up here, there's some funny stuff going on there. I don't know if that's from the capacitors or something else, but regardless, in order to fix this issue, one way is to get a repair kit that will include all the capacitors that we need to replace and try to do it ourselves. However, the problem with that is if the leaking capacitors have damaged the traces on these boards, diagnosing and repa repairing those is not gonna be as easy. So the second option, which might be the better option, is to send them in and have them repaired. There's people on eBay that would do it for 200 bucks and a couple of them have 100% reviews and give three or four, five years of warranty on their work. So I'm sure it works out just fine most of the time. I haven't decided which route I'm gonna go. If I try to do it myself, I'll make a video on that. But as far as this video is concerned, here's how you can use some basic electrical laws or rules, let's say, to try to diagnose uh, problems with your car's electrical systems. Again, or I guess if you haven't heard of them, Ohm's law, and also these two, Kirchhoff's loop rule and also Kirchhoff's junction rule. If you can understand those three 100% and completely, you can diagnose, not only diagnose problems with your car's electrical system, but also come up with easier, let's say, or innovative ways of diagnosing and finding the problems in the electrical systems of different components. I might make separate videos for each of those rules, but I have a feeling that we're getting way into the nitty gritty, the electrical stuff, and I've been out and always when I do that, I lose a bunch of subscribers. For a while, we might mix it up and do more simple automotive repair stuff. Like, I don't know, next week we might replace some belts or do a timing belt or brakes and stuff to just to have a balance. But I will make videos on these stuff in the future, that's for sure. But in the meantime, don't forget to share this video and spread the word and help me reach my lifelong goal of being super, super famous. I'm gonna be so famous where we have so many paparazzi that we can get away with breaking their cameras and punching them. Yeah, that's the level of famous we're going for. But in the meantime, you can check out my other videos in the suggestion box, links below in the description box as well, and I'll see you guys next time.